So fake news is a phrase we've been hearing in the news a lot in the last few years, right? And it's the idea that when we hear a headline or read a story from a quote-unquote news source, uh, that it's possible that the news source is not very credible and is in fact providing to us some sort of lie or deception. Well, how do we ever assess the credibility of a source? Not just in terms of news, but in terms of information and uh, knowledge claims in general. When somebody's giving you advice on what to do in terms of financial advice or with what to do in terms of what to, uh, where to apply for college or when a physician is giving you advice on what to do with your health or when anybody is giving you advice on what to do with your body, how do you assess the credibility of that source? Now, credibility is different than usefulness, right? Somebody could be useful to you, but that's different than asking, well, should I believe them, right? Uh, do they have enough knowledge for me to believe them? Are they a person or a source that won't lie to me? This is about assessing credibility of a source. So let's take a look at the following headlines, and I want you to get a gauge for yourself on whether or not you find the headline to be plausible, like, you know, within the realm of possibility or completely unbelievable. Okay, so if you have a piece of paper, go ahead and sketch down for yourself, plausible or unbelievable. Dick Cheney is a robot. World's smartest ape goes to college. Vatican praises Homer Simpson. Alien backs Clinton. Mexico rolls up world's largest enchilada. Barack Obama related to Sarah Palin, Rush Limbaugh, and George W. Bush. Killer Swan blamed for man's drowning. Abraham Lincoln was a woman. Alien Bible found. And Batman escapes in Maryland. Okay, so hopefully you've jotted down for yourself whether you find the claim to be, or the headline to be plausible or unbelievable. Let's take a look at some of these. Dick Cheney is a robot, actually, is a headline from Weekly World News. Uh, go ahead and check out some of the other articles you can find in the Weekly World News, and you'll see things like Freaks, Geeks, and Weirdos, or maybe that's just the logo or the, the mission statement for the paper. Uh, you can see things like... Um, uh, articles on looks like deformed babies. <laughs> so this would probably be a little bit unbelievable, or at least should be unbelievable to you. Uh, world's smartest ape goes to college. What do you think? Plausible or unbelievable? Uh, this also comes from Weekly World News. Uh, again, you can see some very uh, believable headlines like nine-month-old baby gets black belt in karate. Uh, so most likely not something that actually happened. Uh, Vatican praises Homer Simpson. Now this comes from Reuters. If you don't know Reuters, Reuters uh, is an aggregate for news, right? They, uh, Reuters as opposed to um, the Weekly World, what is it? Weekly World News. Uh, Reuters is, is deemed a much more credible source. Uh, places or uh, magazines like Weekly World News are referred to as tabloids, right? These are what you find in the grocery aisle as you walk out, um, whose headlines are meant to excite you and curious enough to 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 buy them off the shelves. Uh, you know, back in the, when I was growing up in the 80s and 90s, um, some people actually believed all the headlines they saw in the Weekly World News. Um, I think more people nowadays are a little bit... Um, cynical about these headlines. Not that they're not based off true stories, but Weekly World News and you know papers like these, their purpose is to make money in any way possible using sensational headlines. And it's known that they aren't necessarily trying to inform the public. While news sources like Reuters, um, they're based upon journalism that is meant to inform the public. Um, so here we have a story about the Simpsons that have been blessed by the Vatican. Uh, the official Vatican newspaper has declared that beer-swilling, donut-loving Homer Simpson and his set Bart are actually 
Catholics. <clears throat> Number four, alien backs Clinton. So this comes from the Weekly World News. Mexico rolls up world's largest enchilada. This comes from the Associated Press. Again, uh, something that we consider to be a much more credible news source uh, as opposed to a tabloid. You don't go to the grocery store and buy the Associated Press, right? Associated Press is an organization that presents or you know, gathers news and shares news to the public. Um, here we see that they describe um, some people that are trying to get into the Guinness uh, record books, right? Six, Barack Obama related to Sarah Palin, Rush Limbaugh, and George W. Bush. This comes from the LA Times, so uh, a popular newspaper, um, so probably a little more credible. So the idea is that Ancestry.com says the president uh, and uh, Sarah Palin are 10th cousins um, by way of a common ancestor and also through Ancestry.com we see possible relations at least in terms of you know family history to these other figures. Seven, killer swan blamed for man's drowning. And this is from ABC News. Uh, an angry swan is being blamed for knocking a man out of his kayak in the Chicago pond and they continue to attack until the man drowned. Eight, Abraham Lincoln was a woman, comes from Weekly World News. And again, it is part of a magazine that also includes top five disgusting diets for 2002 and uh, a, a subtitle here that says uh, shocking pics found in White House basement of Lincoln being a woman. So uh, something interesting to keep in mind if you're a Abraham Lincoln buff. Number nine, Alien Bible Found. Again, Weekly World News, and guess what? They worship Oprah. Um, and on a side note, apparently we've discovered, uh, discovered Aladdin's lamp. <laughs> okay. Uh, number 10, Batman escapes in Maryland. So here we have a story from the Detroit News. Again, a little bit more credible source. Motorist dressed as Batman escapes ticket in Maryland. Okay. So obviously when we see these claims, just like, just like we talked about last uh, lecture, you know, uh, we can assess the believability of the claims just on their own, right? Based upon what we've seen in the world, based upon personal observation, um, and based upon what we know of the world, based, you know, uh, due to how we grew up, due to our schooling and education, due to our own personal research, you know, maybe based upon what um, you've learned, you don't believe aliens exist, <laughs> maybe based upon what you've learned about the world, you don't believe that um, Abraham Lincoln was a woman, so then automatically a red flag is brought up to you um, based upon you know your past experience and uh, your education. So that refers to the believability of the claim. So you come to an initial plausibility of it based upon those two factors. But wouldn't have it have been also useful if we had known where the headline came from in the first place? Wouldn't have been useful to have known the source of the information. So what we'll be discussing are ways of judging credibility of sources. You know, why is one source like ABC News more credible than Weekly World News? And this is when I first began teaching this class, this was a much easier discussion. As the years have come along and with the last presidential election, now it's a little more difficult to show people or to convince people of why certain news sources are more credible than others. What we hear now from people is anytime they hear a headline that just goes against what they want to believe, there's a tendency to call it fake news, right? Uh, regardless of how credible the source is. If there's a headline or a claim made by a news source that goes against what somebody wants to believe to be true or goes against their opinion or goes against their way of looking at the world, they often, well, nowadays, we'll often hear them talk about, hey, that's fake news. Well, why is it that something like ABC News might be more credible than something like Weekly World News? Well, let's think about that for a second. Um, places like Reuters or Associated Press or ABC News, I mean, uh, these uh, are based upon a model of business that is supposed to have 
the trust of their readership. And uh, people turn to these news sources because they believe the claims presented by these news sources. They believe the stories presented by these news sources. This is why when you go to journalism school, you know, you're taught to, you know, um, find multiple sources, um, verify, verify the credibility of the sources for your news articles. Uh, you're taught ways in which um, you are supposed to um, go through due diligence to determine whether or not you believe the source of your information is valid enough to present to the public. Because you know that if the public ever doubts your trustworthiness, then no one's going to ever believe anything you write. Nobody would want to go look for news from your paper, from your website, right? As opposed to something like Weekly World News, where the business model is to sell the paper regardless of the truthfulness of the articles. In fact, the business model is to create articles that are sensational so that people are drawn to read it, right? And this is known. People understand this about tabloids, that the whole point of tabloids are to sell papers. And it doesn't matter how truthful they are because people aren't looking for truth necessarily from tabloids. They're looking for something interesting to read. That's how they make their money. The problem nowadays is that there are lots of websites or quote-unquote news sources that appear credible but are in fact based upon a model of something similar to weekly world news it's not so much about gaining trust or truthfulness but about getting readership and oftentimes getting readership means giving readers what they want to hear because if people get what they want to hear from you they're more likely to go back to you as a news source even though you are lying to them, even though you are distorting the truth. Now, let's go back to our NSYNC crime argument to get a sense for what the keys are to determining credibility of sources. So let's refresh our memory of the famous NSYNC crime argument. The criminal wears size 7 shoes. Only members of the boy band NSYNC could have committed this crime. Justin Timberlake is the only member uh, of NSYNC with size 7 shoes. Therefore, Justin Timberlake must have committed the crime. Okay, what would make you more likely to believe or less likely to believe the premises above? Well, first, in addition to assessing the plausibility of the claim, first you should ask yourself, how do we know these things? How do we know that the criminal wears size seven shoes? Okay, what if I told you that we know this from an eyewitness account, from a person that was actually there? Well, that would maybe be a little more credible than from somebody who heard from somebody else that the criminal wore size seven shoes, right? An eyewitness account may be a little more credible than that. But then what if I told you that the eyewitness account comes from a 90-year-old blind show, shoe salesman at the scene of the crime? Well, now, because the person does not have the ability to see you may question the credibility of the source, right? You may question the reliability of what they know because they don't necessarily have the capability of knowing what it is they say they know. Or at least it's not as foolproof as somebody else who had a less of a vision impairment. What if I told you that the only member of the boy band in sync that could have committed, uh, only members of the boy band in sync could have committed this crime comes from a private investigator, right? Not from some, um, uh, not, not from somebody working at McDonald's that was across the street from the crime scene who kind of heard some rumors about in sync. Now, what if it comes from an actual private investigator? Well, maybe a little more credible of a source, right? Than somebody that just heard something from somebody else. But what if I told you that it was a private investigator that was self-trained online but owns a popular blog? Well, now you may ask yourself questions about this person's expertise. I mean, you can say you're a private investigator, but if you're self-trained online, shouldn't we question how good of a private investigator you are? If you own a popular blog, might you have reason to exaggerate the truth? in order to get more readers, right? Because that's how you make your money. Should we necessarily trust you?
What if I told you that we know Justin Timberlake is the only member with size 7 shoes because we found out from fellow NSYNC member Lance Bass? Well, I mean, there's some credibility maybe because Lance Bass is actually a member of NSYNC. So if anybody would know what size shoe Justin Timberlake would wear, there's a good chance Lance Bass would know. But if it's also Lance Bass, is there any chance he might be biased? Is there any chance that he may, uh, because of animosity um, or because of jealousy, isn't there any reason Lance Bass might be biased against Justin Timberlake? So these are all things you need to keep in, into account when thinking about the credibility of a source. So let's outline these. Okay. Oh, let's look at one more. I had one for you. What if that source was Justin Timberlake? Well, if Justin Timberlake says he wears size 7 shoes, maybe a little more credible than Lance Bass. Okay, so let's outline these keys to credibility. Some people may be intentionally deceptive, right? Some people have reason to lie to us. So one thing you should watch out for is the truthfulness of the source. Does the source have an agenda? Is there anything that they could gain by not telling us the truth? Is there anything that they could gain by misleading us? So if you want to relate this back to you know news sources, if you were to take a look at where it is you saw the headline, is there any reason for that news source to lie to us? Does that news source particularly pen... Does that news source pander to a particular demographic or to a particular side of the political aisle, right? Does your friend who's giving you advice, would they gain anything by telling you that specific advice? If you go to buy um, a used car from somebody on Craigslist and you meet them at, you know, at a Starbucks and they tell you all these things about the car, would they have any reason to lie to you? right? This is what we mean by the truthfulness of the source. And let's say the source is truthful. Well, it still could be that the source is not very objective. Somebody could have the, you know, somebody could intend to be truthful, but because of how they grow up, because of what they're used to seeing, because of how they see the world, they may be biased or lean towards one side of an issue and maybe not tell you what's actually happening, what's actually true, right? Because of personal experience, because of what they've gone through in life, um, they may tell you an opinion or give you an opinion, and maybe they may not be trying to lie to you, but it may be a biased opinion. Three. What's the reliability of the source's knowledge? We saw a second ago that we had an eyewitness there at the scene of the crime who's telling us that the murderer must have had size 7 shoes. But if they aren't able to see or if they didn't have any way of measuring, then how reliable is their knowledge? Is there any way in which they may be mistaken just because the way they got the information themselves isn't reliable? And then four, again, people could and people could want to tell us the truth, but maybe they just don't have the expertise to actually make the claim that they are making, right? They don't have the skills or necessary background and education to say something about a particular subject. This is referred to ex this is referred to as expertise. So if you remember anything about Star Wars. Uh, in return, uh, what is it? In um, Empire Strikes Back, Luke goes to find this uh, mysterious Jedi Master named Yoda. Uh, Luke finds Yoda, but doesn't recognize him or doesn't believe this to be a Jedi Master when they first meet. And it's because the way Yoda presents himself, he presents himself in a way that doesn't appear to be credible. In fact, he doesn't really even want to appear credible, right? So when we are trying to uh, make somebody believe us, we can take a look at those four keys we looked at a second ago and try to boost up our trustworthiness. We can try to make ourselves appear reliable. 
We can try to make ourselves sound like we are experts at something in order to become more believable to somebody else. On the flip side, when you are trying to evaluate whether or not to believe someone, you should watch out for those keys. You know, do they have any reason to lie to us? Is there any way that based upon, you know, who they are and where they live and their, you know, their experiences that they, they might be biased when they give us an opinion? Is there any, any reason why they may be limited in their ability to know something? So maybe we shouldn't rely on their knowledge or maybe, you know, based upon their education and their experience, they just don't know enough to make the claim that they're making. Right. So. Here are some ways of looking at or determining or guessing whether or not somebody has expertise. You can obviously look at their education. If somebody's trying to give you a, uh, an assessment of your computer, you know, were they educated in, you know, computers in any way? Do they have an education that shows that they've studied computers so that when they make the claim, you should replace this on so your motherboard, you can go, okay, they have relative expertise. So I should trust them. Experience. Do they have the experience in the field that would allow them to gain expert knowledge so that when they say, hey, um, I think this is what you should do for your liver. Um, is this a doctor that has had experience working with patients with liver issues? Reputation. Um, you can look people up and find out if they're a reputable source. I mean, this is something you probably do when you are um, uh, looking at uh, places to go to eat or looking for services on Yelp. I mean, you look at reviews to get a sense for reputation, right? Uh, their position. Does the person hold a certain position in a certain field that would indicate that they have expertise, right? Are they a um, teaching assistant in um, chemistry or are they a a full-fledged professor in chemistry, or are they a student in chemistry, right? Position can give you a sense for expertise. Do they have any achievements or awards that indicate they have been recognized by others as being experts? These are all ways in which you can gauge or come to a sense of credibility. Again, nothing is foolproof, right? People will appear a certain way uh, intentionally to be able to persuade others to believe them. So the homework assignment for this week, the written homework, is uh, to watch a series of videos from um, a documentary called Scammed, you know, where, where people are intentionally trying to scam other people to believe certain claims. Now, the way you scam people is you, you become trustworthy. You do things to promote your trustworthiness or to convince people of your trustworthiness. You do things to make you come across as experts, right? So one thing to keep in mind is that somebody could be an expert in one field. Let's say they're an expert in physics. But just because they're an expert in physics doesn't necessarily mean they're an expert on anatomy or an expert on physical exercise, right? Just because somebody's an expert in one field doesn't necessarily make them an expert on another field. So we have to be careful. We have to be careful about prejudging somebody as being uh, more of an expert than they actually are. So let's take a look at some examples here. You know, if you were to watch a TV advertisement, which you may have done in the past, and you see that they're advertising for a weight loss drink, right? What would make you question the credibility of that source? They'll say something like, you know, you drink our, our shake and you can lose up to 20 pounds over two weeks. What would make you question the credibility of that source? What do those sources do to make themselves appear more credible? Take a second. Try to figure this out on your own. What would you think about? Well, how would you answer these questions? Try to answer the same questions for the following. A blog post about how to make money online. There's lots of bloggers out there and lots of blogs that are geared towards teaching people how to make money, usually easily, online. What would make you question the credibility of those bloggers? What do some of those bloggers do to make themselves appear more credible? Again, take a second, pause the video if you need to. Try to write this out on your own. It's practice, right, for the, for the midterm. Three, 
political talk show hosts discussing the merits of the latest health care bill. So talking heads are on TV all the time telling you their opinion on things. And they say they support or they don't support or it's stupid or it's great. What would make you question the credibility of what they're saying, the credibility of the source? What do these pundits of political talk show hosts do to appear more credible to their audience? Again, take a second and write down how you would think through these questions. Or how about a scientific research paper on how eating chocolate can be beneficial to your health? Okay. Most people think, oh, it's a research paper. We have to believe it. Well, what would make you question the credibility of what the research paper is saying? What might the research paper itself do to make itself appear more credible? Okay, hopefully you've had a second to write down your response to those questions. Well, you know, on a TV advertisement for weight loss, you have to remember that any advertisement, right, any advertisement is meant to draw people to buy a product. So obviously they have a reason to lie or exaggerate the truth, right? It's because they make money off convincing people to buy something. They don't make money by being honest. They make money by convincing people that their product is great and is worth getting. So you should be wary of any advertisement you see and any claim made by any of them. Now, what do they do to appear more credible? Well, if you were to watch some of these advertisements, they'll often have real people or they'll claim, right? They'll have a little thing that says real people and they've lost weight. Well, they're trying to use it to show that this is firsthand knowledge. Somebody has actually used it. Somebody's actually lost weight from it as if their knowledge is more reliable. Yeah. Of course, just because some people have lost weight using it doesn't mean everybody will. It doesn't even mean most people will. All right, so something to keep in mind. Well, what else do they do? Well, they often have personal testimonies. If it comes from real people, maybe it's more truthful. They'll also try to establish themselves as a brand name because the more recognizable the brand name, well, the more often people are likely to trust them as opposed to some obscure company that has no track record, right? Again, we're talking about reliability. Large of a track record, seemingly the more reliable the company. Okay, what about blog posts? Um, blog posts for making money, blog posts on how to, uh, or what cars to buy, what the best shoes to buy, or blog posts on how to best raise your children. What do blog posts do? Well. If you're questioning a blog post, you should ask yourself things like, you know, why aren't these people writing for a larger publication where they can make money straight from an employer? And you may ask yourself, well, anybody can blog. You don't need any education. You don't need any experience. All you need is to go to a computer. And even that, you can just go to the public library or school. So maybe we need to be wary of the expertise of the source. Thirdly, well, you know, bloggers make money usually through advertising, which means they want to draw people to their blogs. So just like we saw with tabloids, you know, people could be writing really crazy headlines about, you know, three easy ways to make money within 10 minutes as a way to draw you in in order to make money through their advertisements, as opposed to actually trying to give you truth and useful information. So just some reasons you may want to question blogs, and you can probably think of others, right, besides these. Now, what do they often do to make themselves appear more credible? Well, if you take a look at successful blogs, they often look very clean. They often look very professional. Uh, again, trying to appeal to their trustworthiness, right? If somebody uh, looks professional, maybe they are a, a professional outfit, which means they can be uh, maybe seen as a professional business, which means maybe they are more reliable. Uh, oftentimes, you take a look at blogs somewhere, usually really prominently, you can see a list of credentials. Um, sometimes I'll say stuff like, this blogger, as featured in New York Times, Wall Street Journal, um, Associated Press, um, ABC News, Fox News, and they'll list all of them up at the top uh, to show that they are 
um, reliable, that they have um, a expertise that was acknowledged by all these other places, right? Of course, you know, there are people who are really good at getting themselves booked on these different news programs, who are, who are really good at um, getting their work published on these news sources. And they do that intentionally to build up credibility. Uh, oftentimes, you'll see on some corner of the blog or web page, their list of subscribers, uh, which kind of shows, hey, look, all these people read them. Well, they must be trustworthy because all these other people seem to trust them. In the same vein, they'll often give stats. So some very popular biz, uh, entrepreneurial blogs or you know money online money making blogs, they'll actually tell you this is how much money I made this month using these techniques. Uh, so, so this is the reason why you should believe me because it's working for me. See, I'm being honest with you. Right. So lots of ways in which they can become or appear more credible to others. Well, but politicians or political talk show hosts and pundits that discuss any sort of issue, whether it's uh, the latest um, uh, to come out out of uh, the, the latest from the president, uh, the latest bill in front of Congress, um, the latest uh, political debate. Um, what? How do we assess the credibility of the people that are giving us their opinion on these things? Right. What it is? What is it that we should question? Why is it we should question them? Well, again, oftentimes these pundits are really strongly opinionated. So that should indicate to you there's some bias here. Um, for a lot of issues, there are things on both sides to discuss. Uh, sometimes when people are very opinionated, it can show that they have a, a, a psychological attachment to one side of the issue or one side of the political aisle than another. Obviously, some people are strongly opinionated because they really believe something to be true or there's something that they really firmly believe in and value, right? If you are uh, a, a firm believer in um, uh, civil rights, you know, obviously you can, you'll have a strong opinion about it, but just something to keep in mind. These people are paid to be popular, right? They're paid to get viewers. Uh, they are often paid based upon their ratings, because the higher ratings they have, the more people, that means the more people are watching them, which means greater chance for advertisements to take effect on people. The more people to see certain ads, right? So a lot of these programs make their money based upon selling advertisements, and uh, the more popular a show is, means more eyeballs watching it, well, the more money a company is willing to pay for an advertisement on that show, or around that show, or during that show. Right. So if you're trying to be popular, well, you know, there's a chance you might be exaggerating truth. You might be pandering to certain demographics or you might be giving just, you know, a sensational claims and headlines because you want to draw in viewers similar to what we see within tabloids. Right. You should ask yourself, well, if you actually knew something, if you were actually an expert, why are you hosting a show? Wouldn't you want to do something different and make actual change with your knowledge? Wouldn't you want to use your knowledge differently? Again, that's not necessarily the case. You know, maybe they really do believe they're using their knowledge to educate the public, but it's something to have in consideration. Now, what do these people do to make themselves appear more credible? Well, if you take a look at all of them, they look professional. Suits, right? If people look professional, there's a better chance that we believe them to be experts. There's a better chance that we consider their opinion to be coming from a reliable source because they appear more trustworthy to us. If you take a look at how they talk, they will often will not sound weak. They'll intentionally try to sound aggressive or try to sound calm to show some sort of air of, um, of intellectual ability to so to present themselves in a way that seems like um, somebody that knows what they're talking about, right? Again, uh, expertise or reliability of knowledge. Take a look at the colors of the sets. All the sets for all of these talk shows are based upon American flag colors, red, white, and blue, because that appeals to our sense of uh, nationalism and if you are appealing to our sense of nationalism, maybe you are somebody we can believe in, 
right? You are American just like me. I should believe in you then too. So let's take a look at one more example. Uh, how can we assess the credibility of a scientific research paper on, let's say, anything from uh, latest diet fads to um, how to um, go to sleep better to eating chocolate and the benefits of doing that? Well, what would make you question the credibility of the source? You have to ask yourself, well, who did the research? Who paid for the research? Is there any reason why the person that read the research or any way in which they could, they would want to mislead us to believe something? Look at who funded the research. Uh, is, are they a source that would have any gain or get any benefit from a certain result being true? Right? If the research for eating chocolate and having benefits comes from a university, Okay, maybe a little more credible, maybe a place you can believe in. If the funding for the research comes from Hershey, you may want to question whether or not they have ulterior motives, right? Can the researcher who's doing the research maybe indirectly get any benefits from presenting uh, a certain um, uh, result from their research? Maybe there's a researcher who, if you looked in their background, you see that they really have an interest in a certain uh, field uh, um, where they might want to get into business in that field in the future. So maybe the researcher that's looking at the in chocolates, you can find out through their history that they have a desire to get into the, the chocolate industry and get hired by a famous chocolate manufacturer. So maybe that's motivation for them to present research that shows eating chocolate can be beneficial, right? This is something to keep in mind in Washington too, when we see certain politicians or certain people uh, within certain departments who have a history of working for certain companies. So when we see them uh, promote certain policies, are they promoting the policy because it's a benefit to all Americans or are they promoting the policy because if they were to leave their government position and go back to industry, go back to business, they could benefit from that policy. Right? That happens all the time. Maybe somebody that works in the oil industry is put into a position where they, they can affect policy on you know, uh, uh, the types of cars you manufacture, policies in, on whether we're allowed to uh, dig up oil in certain places and run pipelines in certain places? Might they have any motivation to pass certain policies with regards to those things so that once they are no longer in that position with the government, they can go back to their industry and make a profit? Right? Something to consider. So how does a research paper appear more credible? Well, they'll often use words and language that sound very good right terms that sound sophisticated in order to make themselves appear to have more expertise uh, if you take a look at um, uh, the attribution and uh, who is listed as the researcher you'll often see um, various degrees right this person has a phd uh, a master's uh, a doctorate which phd <laughs> you'll often see other institutions that they studied under or studied in right to show that they have expertise uh, sometimes you'll see long lists of sources within a paper saying, hey, to make it seem as if the researcher has gone through and done lots and lots of research to verify this conclusion. Sometimes papers will include lots of graphs and tables and equations to make it look very official. Sometimes these things aren't needed, by the way. Sometimes sophisticated language isn't needed. And in fact, sometimes sophisticated language and graphics and tables are kind of smoke streams. They're there to kind of divert us from actually paying attention to what's in the paper, right? Just it's kind of like bells and whistles to make it look kind of fancy. I'd be careful about any sorts of papers that come across as a little bit too convoluted, as a little too hard to understand. Uh, if you are stating, if you are trying to publish papers that pre present research to the general public, um, again, to the general public, not necessarily to other academics, to the general public, you'd want it to be accessible to the general public, easy for them to, to grasp, right? So. Uh, you might be careful when reading papers. That's meant for us, the public, 
well, why would they include such crazy paragraphs and weird language? Uh, for academic paper, meant for academics, one thing. For a paper, meant for general consumption, you know, it might be a little different. Okay, so various ways in which to gauge the credibility of a source. So for the midterm, when you're asked, okay, I want you to describe what would go through your mind when accessing or when assessing the credibility of particular sources, you'd ask yourself, does the source have any reason to lie to me? Do they get any benefit from exaggerating the truth or misleading me? Is there any way that the source is biased? That, you know, they'd want me to believe this, not because they're trying to lie to me, but because they're just, they're, they're lying, they're, they're biased about this. So, you know, you can imagine a, um, you know, you're trying to figure out, well, who is the best baseball player in baseball? So you ask your friend who knows baseball, who follows baseball, who's the favorite, who's the best baseball player? And they give you a name. So let's say they say, um, they say, uh, Madison Bumgarner, the best player in baseball. Okay, well, they may not intentionally be lying to you, but if they're a big Giants fan, they may be biased, right? So you have to keep a uh, keep your eye out for any sort of bias. Do they have? Uh, can we uh, uh, can we trust the, the the reliability of that source? Um, is there any reason why they physically would not have access to knowledge that they say they are presenting to us? And lastly, do they have expertise? Is there any? Can, should we question? Uh, whether or not they have the education and the skill level to know what they say they actually know. Okay? So always think about those four things when you're trying to assess the credibility of a source.